Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Of Dyson Men commentary. We're going to talk about what went on in the show, and we might have to end early, but so be it. So, we start off the show just by introducing the characters like we do always. Caterino over here is going to be the party leader. In Control over here is going to be the party muscle. Lily Pichu is going to be the party's um, knowledge base. And Destiny is going to be the party's uh, investigatory aspect. You know, the fine getting to the places where you're not supposed to be to get the information you're not supposed to have. Uh, and we'll just do our basic introductions here. I'm Daff. I am the uh, I'm the leader of the party. I am a bard. solid introductions and happening here. Super good. Um, so we're gonna skip ahead a little bit here, and where is this is where we want to go. We're gonna skip to about this part. This here is the party's base. Uh, to be honest, I actually only finished putting this together above like. 10 minutes before the stream started and the next time we see this i hope it will have improvements and a second story somehow i just forgot to build their their base of operations and so it was like hastily thrown together uh, the tile sets used here are the slap downtown tile sets from uh gabriel pickard on rule 20 and then you know that's for the the base some of the decorations come from other tile sets or whatnot but the general idea is that this is their meeting room. The front door is actually hidden just behind this title screen, so you can't quite see it, but there's a, a door at the top here. Uh, this is a staircase that goes up to their bedrooms above. Here's sort of a kitchen area and a storage area. These are all windows. To be honest, there also needs to be a back door. Uh, there should be a back door somewhere over here, but we'll, we'll add it the next time around. Um, I am, I... So, while well, the party introduces themselves, uh, what's going on here is that we're... I'm trying to get the party to figure out what the interactions are between them, sort of like day-to-day -day interactions of party members. Because we, we're coming into this group having been accomplices or been um, co-workers for a while now, so we gotta sort of figure out how they interact. We can't just start in the middle of combat. I mean, I guess we could, but I, I like to get a feel for the party and their their back and forth interactions. So let's listen for a minute. Pass it, and did she transform back into human? Yes, actually, when Valdor, Valdor and so I first met, Yeah. This is where they're talking about turning Toki into a uh, a rabbit, and then eating her, letting her sit in pain while they digest her, and then letting her turn back in order to to uh, save some money on food. Just why they need to save money on food is because we have a pretty detailed finances system here, even though we haven't shown it on screen yet. I have a spreadsheet, let me open it right now, that tracks what their ongoing expenses are. So they have 8,000 copper a month for rent, and each person has a monthly upkeep of 1,000 copper for cost of living and everything. And if you bring that into the real world, that's about... 8,000 bucks for rent, but that doesn't just, that's not housing, that's housing an office, and it's a pretty big space and everything, and then $1,000 per person in personal upkeep, which is actually quite reasonable in, like, the modern American world, at least. Uh, the rent is high, but it's because it's, you know, big office, house combination, everything. So their monthly expenses are 12,000 copper, which means they just need to make 12,000 copper a month to, to get by. Uh, and now we talk about their last cases here. Let's listen for a moment. Incredibly, incredibly disappointing. Um, mm. A woman contacted us <clears throat> to let us know that her husband had been moving uh, a huge amount of illegal contraband. Uh, and this is something that Destiny is making up on the fly here. That if we would have found out, if we would have actually cracked this case, it would have made headlines all across the kingdom. And, so and it's important to me and to the campaign that their last quest was a bit of a failure because we want them to be starting off with like a, a nice clean start where they're broke and they need X amount of money to get what they need. We want to put them in a position where they have a strong motivation to get their shit done. So it's the first quest. We don't want them to be able to like, nah, fuck it. This is difficult. We're not getting at it. Let's just move on, right? We want to put them in a position where they, they really need some money here. So that's why I asked him to find a failed quest as their last quest. 
first. Because when she told us initially uh, what the case was going to be, we uh, we spent a lot of time talking about it, deciding as an agency if we really wanted to take on a case of this magnitude. All right, let's skip ahead a little uh, bit until little the money, you know, our... chancellor arrives. Really All right. Sorry for... There I'm we also go. Coming the door with my oh, let me my back book. it up just a wee bit. Here we have uh, so the Kate Reno having to go to the door, and I'm going to focus on this weird Hello. thing. Thank you. Why, why are you looking at a bush? You're talking okay, to Prince let me, let me rotate Right, that might seem like a snide comment by the DM, like, why are you looking at a bush? Har, har, har. Right, but there, there's actually something behind this, is that this is at least Daff, Katerino's first ter time using Roll20, and by saying you're looking at the bush, I'm trying to get her to realize that she can move her token around. It comes off as, like, a snide joke, but this is more... It was intended as a teaching people mechanics of how to use Roll20. Small little detail, not really important, but that's what we're here to talk about. I'm Daff, the leader of this year organization. Uh, how may I help you today? There has been a bit of a problem. My female voices just sound like my voice outside of town. The, the Black Paw mine, to be specific. Mm. Uh, it appears that everyone there has been slaughtered. Ruth, so here we're just we introducing the broad concepts of the quest just enough that they get a picture of what's happening um one of the things i also didn't really prep was this exact conversation i knew that the chancellor would come and see them and give them the quest and take them back to the the keep but then you know that's about as far as i got uh and so then i'm kind of winging this whole this is what she has to say the room and take a look around at the assembled people it says are these come in you can come in, no problem. Good bit of role play there by Daff. And she will Let step in my... and take a seat at the table. Just, ah. What are they doing? All right. So we leave the guards outside, have the chancellor come inside, but we specifically mention that there are guards with her because we want to instill in the party's mind and in the viewer's mind that this is an important woman who's being guarded as she goes about her business. The guards stay outside, mostly because I didn't want to go find guard tokens and resize them because I didn't have a grid set up already on this and I didn't want to change a bunch of settings. Otherwise, I probably should have had one guard come in the building and one guard stay out of the building. But again, I didn't prep the tokens ahead of time and I found myself fumbling, so we just brought her into the table and said the guards are outside. Uh, but there ought to have been a guard in here with this that. Her mine is of paramount importance to our operations here. And. <clears throat> well, is this not the spot? It we were sounds you very. I thought this was going to be the spot. Uh, at some point in here, we talk about the Iron Mine, and we mentioned that the Iron Ridge and Cronwick have a lot of access to Iron, which is a scarce resource. For those of you that are intimately familiar with Arcadia, you already know that Iron is rare, and most people use copper-based things. These people are starting off in the Iron-rich area, where most of the Iron is produced. So everyone's going to basically start with Iron gear, and it's not going to be a big deal. It's just, there's so much Iron here. Everyone here just uses Iron for all their supplies. Then people will trade it out and whatnot, but um, all of our PCs are just going to be starting with Iron iron crap because it's the iron rich area which is important in arcadia and if you aren't intimately familiar with arcadia you don't really notice these details and they don't really matter uh voa is there also they named it voa which is supposed to be very observant agency or so i don't remember what it was but like five minutes before the show started they told me they were going to call it sherlock gnomes investigation agency which i thought we were going with and apparently we're not i'm a little i i kind of would have rather had them be called sherlock gnomes instead of very observant agency or very obtuse agency i don't remember that what it stands for quite the appropriate sum to be paid for this job yes mm -hmm. or yes. ah I'm just saying this we can keep here they're talking about prices right and i knew ahead of time that i wanted them to take 10k for the job and i was initially just going to offer 10k and at the last moment i'm like of course i'm not going to offer 10k jeff is playing he's definitely going to try and like raise the price on this stuff and steven they will never accept the first offer so i dropped it by uh by two so it would be eight and that way 10 is halfway between eight and 12 and i figured they would push for 12 because they need 12k as we mentioned before so i dropped it from 
being paid 10 to being paid 8 so when they haggle I could go up and still meet my 10k quota and the reason I want them to be paid 10k is so that they will still just be short of their monthly expenses that way they have to finish this quest line um, and the next quest line within a month in order to make ends meet so it was very intentional trying to get them just under their monthly quota. Toki's sick. You probably heard a cop. Yes. He, he said sob over the body. Sob over the body. Dead, yes. dead people, very sad. They're We're gonna so scroll back just a moment. You uh, probably heard a cop. A little bit of a discount. Listen Rob to Veldur. Blind. Wait, Time listen to Veldur. What do you say we give him a little bit of a discount? Rob the body's blind, make up the 12,000, and that's kind of what we do. I'm sorry, did you say rob the bodies? I, sir? Right there. So that's the... No, Valdur is saying we rob the bodies, and I have What's-Her-Face say, like, you know, rob the bodies, what the hell's going on? They talk their way out of it, and this is uh, specifically devised to get the players to think about who is in the room when they say the things that they say, because I want to be able to use... How do I say? I want the players to be more immersed in their role play. I want them to be like, I'm going to step outside of the room and have this conversation just with the party before coming back in. So when someone says something a little bit weird and there's witnesses to it, I want to call them out on that so that they will start thinking about who's in the room when I say the things that I say. Who am I sharing this information with? Um, of course, this is the, it's the first session. We're just a few minutes in. I don't want to like you know, ream them for this. I'm trying to get the whole party going together. So we let them easily talk their way out of it, but we are still trying to remind them who's in the party when you're talking about this shit. It's important to know. Um, All right, so let's skip ahead a little bit. The hand as a compromise. Oh yeah, this whole thing about like kissing the feet to kissing the hand, that was just weird, but fun and amusing. I think. So we skip ahead. Where are we going? On Wick's three retainer knights who sort of help do his bidding on the outside. Right. So I'm introducing the members of this council. And initially, I sort of wanted the members of this council to be um, some of the suspects, or at least to be able to be suspected. So I went through and I wrote out like a lot of information about these people. Later in the session, we'll talk about needing uh, means, motive, and opportunity from witnesses. That's something I intend intended from the onset to introduce to them. So I wrote out the means, motive, and opportunity for every NPC that I was going to introduce for uh, Kel Drake Silverhorn, Kel Matthias Redditch, Kel Kiri Brohard, Nina Thervin, the Chancellor, Polywig, the Ranger, Ark Dorian, the Mage, Lady Sandra, the Wife, all of these people, any of the named NPCs I've introduced thus far, I've wanted to like have be a, a reasonable suspect. So I introduce everyone at the start briefly, and I figured out what, you know, why they might want to be involved in this or how they could be involved in it or whatnot. Um, that way we're well prepared for everything. What gives us an edge in battle when everyone else is using weapons made of copper alloys. Here we're talking about that uh, iron stuff that I thought we were going to talk about earlier. Is, was, I should say, owned by Drake, uh, <clears throat> not Drake, uh, Lord Silverhorn. And he motions to one of his knights here, uh, <clears throat> Kel Silverhorn's uncle. All right, so we're going to skip ahead a little bit. At some point, uh, Kel Drake Silverhorn offers to escort the party to the mines. And that was something I did on the fly. My original intent was just to have the party go on their way and have that kobold ambush that we see later in the episode happen on their way to the mine. Um, which I think, in retrospect, would have been the better solution. Uh, on the fly, I said Drake would come with them. And I kind of regret that. I think that was a bad decision because we end up going into a lot of investigation really, really early without a lot of action. And I feel like that sort of dulled the pace of play. I think if we had gotten the quest, had an encounter, a combat encounter along the way, and then did investigation, the pacing would have been a lot better. But instead, it's just dialogue and conversation for the first hour and a half or hour and 45 minutes until the mountain lions show up. Um, which, you know, so how many people let's skip ahead a little bit more. Um, skip into here, maybe a little bit. Scroll up, buddy. Scroll up. 
overseeing it when it was all right so also in this session in this game we've moved to a hex grid uh, i've talked about the hex grids on my own stream elsewhere a bunch or a little bit i guess uh and i've been wanting to move to a hex grid system movement in DD is kind of complicated and kind of annoying you're sort of like measuring and guessing and usually that's fine but when we have roll 20 to use, I feel like it's a little bit of work to get a lot more fun out of it if we use a hex grid system. So I slightly redesigned the map to make sure that all the buildings would fall within a hex somewhere and uh, made ourselves a, a hex grid system to use. Each grid is five miles and we've got a random encounter chance on every hex that you step on. Um, in this situation, this is one of those examples of faking the dice that I draw. Faking, uh, what do we call it? Random encounter rules, which we're going to do right here. Nope, mm -hmm. I'm still looking for dice. Faking random encounter rules when I already know when they are. Like, All in right. the prep for this, I already did some math and so figured out where random encounters game. would be. And we had a kobold encounter planned. Um, but I figured the four party members are now moving with eight additional soldiers and one knight. And there's no way... Uh, what was that, like 15, 20 kobolds are going to jump uh, 13 humans, well-armed humans. So we just skipped the random encounter because there's no way the kobolds would ambush something like that. Uh, again, should have had the random encounter first and then the investigation, but we all make mistakes. I mean, kill them. Well, given the 50 plus dead bodies, I think it's fair to say that both people have been killed and most likely murdered. Those are good conclusions so far. Yes, well, <clears throat> I mean, we couldn't have, we couldn't have expected much more from, uh, from Valdor, so, uh, I'm, I'm surprised you, uh, you came up with such a, such an astute conclusion. Good job, buddy. Taff, for such a beautiful man, you have such an ugly spirit. But before you respond, <laughs> if so many people were murdered in such a way, we need to consider that this was organized and that they were either trapped or so outnumbered that it was a butcher, in which case... Now, Jeff here... ...bodyguards and some upstart alongside us is a tough fight right so, jeff right here is clearly the best investigator thus far i mean i know we're only a few minutes into the game but he is already thinking about how how many people there are in the mine uh what it would take to destroy them kill them what sort of odds you might be facing he's already churning on like the mechanics of the encounter in an ambush at night if the knight and nevitz response his sword and his armor it seems as though people probably weren't there to rob them Astute observation. I think these are fair conclusions so far, do you think? Yes, um, well, we'll have to investigate further of, uh, of what's been taken and, you know, uh, the state of the bodies, but I agree that... Now, right here, oh shit, I clicked the wrong button, I have no idea where we are. Was that the... Oh no. We're just gonna I... skip ahead. Where were we? If they're good enough to slaughter 50 people, they're probably good enough to deal with that. So right here, we got the party talking about they're... these things. Oh, Valdur makes the observation sure. that there the are... Night? Retain his sword fuck, and his armor. Valdur makes the observation that there's a lot of people here and it's dangerous. Nevitz makes the observation so that hard. nothing was stolen, and that's yes, important. Um, and Caterino well, we'll makes the observation further of uh, of what's been taken and you know uh, the state of the bodies. I forgot who I mentioned agree. what. That, um... But right here we see our first bit of real good investigating. Uh, Daff is like, we need to take a look at the bodies. Um, and we need to see, you know, what's been taken. Valdura is like, this is a difficult encounter. Something killed a lot of people here. It's going to be really dangerous. And even without seeing any evidence, we've already got some bit of clues going. This bit of investigation, super solid. Really happy with this along the way. I mean, they haven't even no seen the mine. They haven't even seen any clues. And already well, they're making good conclusions based on sound Possibly. evidence. Or at least, you know, sort of observations. Picture, we should appeal to our sage here to make sure that we keep our eyes open so they don't get caught off guard by the same beast that may have killed Good moment people. of Nevitz trying to include Toki in the, the uh, game. A creature with uh, who wields swords, I think that is unlikely. Wait, Daphne did the guy say 100%? Did he say sword wounds? I don't remember. I just heard him say wounds. He did not say yeah. sword weapon. wound. He said, he said weapon. weapon. Oh, oh. Weapon. Which is important. Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah. But not, not teeth. Okay, we'll investigate one thing. Uh, Daph, it is important that you select calming music to sing to us on travels, I would say. All right, this bit I with will, the didgeridoo is fun, but guys. we're going to skip it. Um, and we get the party arriving at the mine. 
Now, this is one of those situations where, two to stand the the where I am, again, Rick, sort of regretting the knight showing up with the guards because it sort of lowers the danger. You know, they were coming to this mine where all these people were killed, but the knight and the guards are here, so they don't really feel threatened. Again, terrible mistake. Should have totally let the knight and the guards stay back, had the party arrive on their own, and then feel like maybe there's some danger here. Maybe we need to investigate these buildings carefully. We don't have backup, right? I... I don't know why the fuck I had him offer to give them an escort. It just seems sensible at the moment. It seemed like the right thing to do. Of course the knight is going to to come back with an escort and watch these guys. It makes lore sense, but it doesn't make good pacing sense in game. So I guess that's why I did it, because it made it good makes good lore sense, and I shouldn't have done it anyway. I should have thought more about mechanical storytelling advantages rather than lore advantages. Sword left in one spot. This looks like a smelter's forge where they would take iron ore and turn it into iron bars. And then just, just like talking about what's going on here, the mechanics of everything. Um, and over here, if my button work, you find- All the of these assets are very carefully and very intentionally placed. Uh, most, some of them are like map packs, like this one right here that we're looking at is one big asset, except for these racks down here and the blood stain. So I just plop that down because it's perfect, and then we throw some weapon racks because the guard should have access to weapons. And we say that there's a staircase or a ladder leading up to a second bunk, but we don't bother showing it. And there's nothing important there, so it's kind of fine. Showing multiple layers of buildings is kind of a pain in the ass in Roll Twenty. So wherever possible, I try not to. Right, why don't you give me a perception check to get in there and notice real close like. And here's a little frustrating. We roll our first perception check to see like what's going on with these things and the party botches it. It looks like a pretty torn up bed. You're gonna have a hard time noticing if there's any stab wounds in here. But we found like, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense that you can't notice a stab wound in a bed. So the only way to really justify such a failure is to say that you, there's no way you could notice it and the bed must just be really worn and torn, which is why I give such a description. If Valador had rolled a natural 20, I probably would have said the bed is in pristine condition and you find no injuries in the bed. In retrospect, this is one of those things where I probably should have said, how long do you investigate the bed? Do you want to make a roll to do, investigate it quickly, or do you want to take like 10 or 15 minutes to like give it a deep and thorough investigation and allowed him to like take 10 or take 20 on a die roll, something like that. But you know, we're all, we're all running investigations for our first time. I think on my stream I've said many, many times that puzzles are difficult to run, and yet here I am making a campaign that is basically a puzzle. Uh, and I think that shows to show how difficult it is to run, because I've been working on this campaign a long time. And it's a little bit difficult to run an investigation because until you have enough information to reach a conclusion, you feel lost, you know? So I should, I think here, I should have been a little bit more careful about giving them a little bit more generous about not calling for rolls, but I just wanted to get some rolls in there. We didn't get that combat encounter. So I want to add some dice rolls at this point. And it's not, you know, uh, yeah. Okay, awesome. So fan. Yeah. Again, investigating so a murder scene. Off. It looks like someone has been hit multiple times and it took them a while to die. Like someone was- Right. So what I'm saying here is pretty different from the rest of the information they're about to find later. Uh, later, they're gonna find information that each person has only been wounded once, maybe twice, and all the wounds go to key areas. Uh, I specifically call out that all the wounds are like killing blows in delicate spots. And that's not just a bit of, um, lore that I'm taught it's not that's not dressing on top of the campaign that's like the core bit saying that these people have all been killed in one strike and a few of them have taken two strikes is the soft way of saying that whoever did this knows their shit and is a high level character or you know at least a mid-level character who's capable of one-shotting a whole bunch of miners and if you think about it mechanically you know a miner has 1d8 hit points maybe eight at the most so if someone's capable of doing eight damage in a single blow or you know maybe four damage in a single you know doing enough damage to kill these 1d8 maybe plus one plus two hp miners uh they're gonna be pretty good but it goes sort of unnoticed in this point the other thing is that this took multiple blows and that there's lots of little blood stains here which shows us that that person put up a much bigger fight 
Um, because it wasn't just one blow to kill them. That's the only person who took like two or three, uh, we didn't say how many, but many blows to kill. Uh, and we called that out very specifically. I don't think I brought it up again later when they were investigating the bodies. Maybe I should have. That might have been a flaw on my part. But that's to say that this high-level fighter, this knight who was guarding here, took a while to kill. The rest of the room, not just the blood stains, but uh, yeah. this... Yeah. Investigation. Uh, no, we'll just we'll roll with your same investigation for the whole area. The rest of the forge looks pretty untouched. Um, you know? Now, another thing that I had set up earlier was a party sheet that has all of the party stats and the best roll, all the like the high rolls of the party. So, you know, they've got an investigation of nine, a, an acrobatics of twelve, a, a nature of four, or whatever. So that we've got like the max stats in here. So we've got like a party stat block. And what I wanted to do was and I've kind of forgotten the moment because there's so much going on, is to have the party sort of roll off of the party sheet and just say, whoever's investigating can take the highest roll of the party, and we're just going to say that's the party's investigation roll into this. And that gets rid of the each person gets their own check. That way, no matter who's investigating, you're using the party's best skill, and if for some reason someone is separated off on their own, then we can have the person use their own individual roll. Um, that's something I'm definitely going to implement going forward. That way the party always gets decent rolls and we don't like roll spam things where everyone checks and we just hope that someone rolls an at 20, which really frustrates me. Uh, trade routes, any, anywhere where people are moving in, in and out a lot? Great questioning by Caterino here. We're in the middle of bumfuck nowhere. There's nothing here for miles. No villages. The whole, like, are there trade routes? Might there be bandits coming around? As a good way of thinking about it, and we see some good early investigation. Unfortunately, it gets shut down because it's nowhere near the, the right thing. And I think maybe this is contributing to the party's, uh, like, they seem to get a little bit lost and run into some problems for maybe, like, half an hour in the middle of the session. And I think that's because they kept hitting up, like, no, what you're looking for is not here. No, what you're looking for is not here. And then they get, like, maybe a little disheartened. Um, you should all be able to that's just the way the cookie crumbles, though. Perfect. Oh, um, shit, this is cool. Did Daft say that? We're gonna skip ahead a wee okay. bit again. We get to see this mine that I worked forever on. We laid out all the bodies. Originally, um, things, the, the clues had been pretty different, and the, the map had been kind of different. The, uh, I don't want to say... I don't want to say exactly what was different because the investigation is still underway and I don't want to give any spoilers, but originally I had planned things to be slightly different and then I moved them around and rearranged them and fixed them a little bit later on. Um, this mine is courtesy of Gabriel Pickard as well, and the tokens are from Devon Knight. These are guys on Roll20 who have artwork that they give around. Unfortunately, we don't get a good view of anything right here. Let's try and skip about to see... Things. We do introduce the magic lanterns as mundane magical items that are available for sale. And we note that they're still here, which is the equivalent of saying that there's a bunch of money lying around, which is the equivalent of saying that people weren't here to steal anything. Because if you're a thief killing people and taking their shit, you would take all the magic lanterns because the magic lanterns are fucking bomb, right? They, they're magic lanterns. You could sell those. You could take them a hundred miles away and sell them for some good money, but no one took them. And that's a pretty big clue that nothing is stolen from the mine. That leaves a lot to be, you know, who would kill everyone here and take nothing? Who with weapons would kill things and take nothing? These are, are big clues. Are you writing all this down, Jeff? Yeah. I don't believe Jeff when he says he's writing things down. I need to take notes next time. Um, I have a little uh, okay. book, book and pen out, so I'm writing stuff down. I sort of believe Nevitz. Okay. Um... Dead bodies for sure. What about around it? Like, are there any are there any clues around? Maybe the bodies we should have not them mechanized the investigation yeah, the a little bit later, watching. better. Because I sort of just put them in the big mine and said investigate. And this is their first investigation. Perhaps I should have laid things out a little bit more clearly, saying like. In the mine, there is this murder room that can be investigated. There's the mine that can be investigated. There's like the, the ledgers and notes that can be investigated. And there's the bodies that can be investigated. Maybe I should have given them some clear definitions of like, this is what you can look into rather than giving them the entirety of this big ass mine to investigate. 
maybe I should have narrowed the scope. Maybe made it just like one room that they should have investigated. Maybe it shouldn't have been such a big slaughter, but I think I gave them too open-ended of, ended of a problem at first. You just run out of like, if you get a torch or something. Oh, so we're gonna skip ahead a little bit. Inspect those. Now here is our brilliant murder room with all sorts of blood and clear bloody footprints uh, coming in and out. This is another one of those weird things, right? I did the map and I saved it and it all sort of like flattened and merged a bunch of layers together. And after I made some changes to it, I would have liked fewer footprints going in and out, but there's a lot right now. I would have rather just had less. Um, not that anyone really looked at the footprints or talked about them very much. That's more for my own annoyances. Uh, yeah. And it's about this point where you hear some shouts and cries coming from the entrance to the mine. And, and those shouts or cries are the mountain lions, which are improvised because we didn't do the kobold encounter on the way here. And the party has been looking around and investigating and look at these faces. These are not the faces of people deeply engaged in the game. These are the faces of people who feel lost and not sure what to do because they're overwhelmed with options. Uh, so we introduce some mountain lions as a way to break the monotony and get back into some combat, maybe spice the game up a little bit. And we're introducing mountain lions, which are some of the apex predators in the area. Pretty difficult, but there's only two of them, so that's not that heavy of an encounter. And unfortunately, they have their knight with them. Uh, one of the cool things about having the knight here and this mountain lion encounter is we can see what type of fighter the knight is. What his Maybe we can see what his attack roll is. Maybe we can see what sort of damage he does. Um, however, if you have seen the encounter, you will know that the knight gets knocked down by a mountain lion and never gets to make an attack roll and is completely and utterly useless in combat. So the like one up shot of introducing the knight and the guards uh, kind of fails okay. and falls right, flat. Because um, again, we're supposed to have everybody that was in that council room be a potential suspect because they're the only NPCs that we've introduced. And then the like one opportunity where we get to learn more about a suspect the suspect is just like knocked down and can't do anything. So that was less than stellar. Uh, unfortunately, we're gonna have to take a short 15 hour break in our commentary right here. We will be back to, shoot, today is Thursday? Oh, we will be back sometime with a little bit more director's commentary. Not right now. Um, maybe tomorrow after critical feedback, we will continue this because unfortunately I have to run to do another game right now. And then, um, there is a Kubit Knights tomorrow morning and critical feedback just after that. So maybe after critical feedback, we'll come back and finish the rest of the director's commentary. It will be on the Twitch VODs if you need to watch it there. Um, and I'll probably upload it to YouTube as well so you can watch it there as well. So that's it for our first episode of director's commentary for Of Dyson Men, episode one. See you guys later.